First thing I want to tell you is how honored I am to be here, to actually be invited rather than incarcerated. Um, and you'll see why as we go further along. Do you all know Johnson? Of course you do. Johnson is a guy at the office that's the top performer. He's the guy that shatters every sales record. He's the guy who's always running 90 miles an hour, the guy who is always at the office. Never goes home. Sometimes he even looks as though he's slept at his desk all night. He has pictures of his wife and kids on his desk, but you've never actually met them. Johnson always has a big cup of coffee and is always stepping out for a quick smoke. Always looks rough in the morning, but by the 10 a.m. sales meeting is commanding everyone's attention. Lately, there's been some big gaps when Johnson disappears. The bosses are all saying, anybody seen Johnson? The clients are on their way. Where the hell is Johnson? Oh, Johnson still shows up, but he's now always late for the, to the meeting. He looks rattled as he comes in, apologizes profusely, and starts muttering something about traffic or something like that. He shifts into high gear, dazzles the client, wins him over, closes the deal, and once again is the hero. Johnson gets a big bonus again this year. At happy hour, Johnson is always the guy that's always saying, one more round. Come on, one more. You'll still make it home on time. He says repeatedly. Then you hear him on the cell phone. Yeah, honey, I'll be there soon. Tell Susie I'll tuck her in tomorrow night. I promise, I'm sorry. You know I love you. You hear him telling his wife. You've had to call Johnson a cab more times than you can remember. He never seems to be able to just have a couple like the rest of you. But God, he's a good guy and moving up the ladder and willing to take you along for the ride. You help him in the bar, he helps you in the office. That's just kind, that's just the kind of guy Johnson is. Salt of the earth and all that. Everybody loves Johnson. Next conversation, did you hear about Johnson? He got a DUI. Could have happened to any of us. We were all there having a few. What? He had Coke? Oh my God, not Johnson. Guess everybody needs a bump every now and then to help them get through the rat race. An eight ball? No way, seriously. Yeah, I guess his wife says she's done. She took the kids and went to the mothers to her mother's, says she just can't do it anymore. The boss says Johnson has been a great performer, but we can't have that kind of stuff around here. Bad for our image, you know. They gave him two weeks severance pay and told him he had to go. It's too bad, he's such a great guy. We're all gonna miss Johnson. Wonder who's getting his office. <clears throat> My name is Keith Bradley, but you can call me Johnson. <laughs> Guys, <clears throat> through this presentation, I want you to know before I start, I'm a real emotional guy. I spent 50 years of my life trying to prove I was a tough guy, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. 
12 years ago, I got clean and sober. And uh, my life changed. So I'm going to give you the short version of a very long story. 58 years ago, almost to the day, I took my first drink of alcohol. It was July 4th, 1959. I was seven. When that alcohol touched my lips, something fascinating happened. I can remember thinking, why haven't they told me about this? I was seven. I run the 4th of July for the entire family. You know, it's kind of hard to celebrate when the seven-year-old's in the bedroom throwing up through his nose. So, the, thing, the reason I tell you that is because I want you to understand that I drank like that at every opportunity from that point forward. You hear a lot of things about an alcoholic crosses over a line, an imaginary line where they're a social drinker for a period of time and they abuse the alcohol to the point to where they no longer can drink successfully. I've never drank once in my entire life successfully. Every time I drank, I had one thing in mind that I wanted to do. And that was as I wanted to get drunk and I didn't want to feel the way I was feeling before I took that drink. Knowing what I know today, and I'll get to all of that, but I've educated myself now on the clinical side of addiction. Knowing what I know today, I know that I was suffering from a huge anxiety disorder when I was seven years old. It was never treated, it was never addressed, it was never diagnosed. I'm not trying to make excuses, but at seven years old, you're, you're searching for something if you're drinking alcohol. So I pretty much went on through that. I married my high school sweetheart. We had two sons. This disease of alcohol and addiction took her at a very early age, 11 years ago. I went on and uh, I did several things. One of the things that was really, really significant to me was that you not know I was afraid. So I did things like always tried, I was a vocal music major which created some problems too because I was on Vern Miller's boxing team who was the sheriff of Sedgwick County at that time he had a young men's boxing team and I was on his boxing team and I sang in the choir It's kind of an odd match but I wanted to do things like if I became a boxer you wouldn't think that I was afraid of anything if I took the center stage and sang solos at high school functions, you wouldn't know that I was afraid. I pretty much continued that all the way into the military and during the military, while I was in the military, I boxed on the United States Army boxing team. And to be very honest with you, the reason I did that was because it got me out of KP, guard duty, and that type of thing. I didn't have to do that if I just boxed on the United States Army boxing team. It seemed like a good trade-off to me at the time. I finished my career in the military. Uh, after 18 months of active duty, they offered me a six-month early out, and I took it. And uh, during that time, I had my first son, and uh, he's now 45. And my youngest son will be 40, uh, just turned 40, as a matter of fact. But uh, they're both in recovery, by the way. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I believe that alcoholism and drug addiction is a disease. And if you're having a problem getting past the idea that it's a disease, try to think of it in this sense. It's a brain disease. Something happens when I take a drink of alcohol. I was talking to this gentleman back here before we started. We were talking about Oxycontin 
and Percocet. A 30-day supply, and he has some physical pain. A 30-day supply lasts him nine months. 30-day supply of either one won't last me two days. I went on and I was pretty determined, the same as everything that I'd ever set my mind to, I'd accomplished. I started in the car business in 1979. And I moved up very quickly. Uh, from a sales position to the assistant used car manager of one of the largest dealerships in the Midwest. We were rocking and rolling. We were on the cover of the new car magazine for the highest percentage of profit for any Ford store in the United States. It was not uncommon during that time. Keep in mind, this is the very early 80s, 81, 82, along in there. It was common practice when my boss, the used car director, would hold a sales meeting, or I would hold it, we would tell all of you guys that are churchgoers to go ahead and leave the, the office, to leave the, the, the sales meeting. And then there was, back then they called them black beauties. They don't have them anymore. We called them LA turnarounds. They were a form of an amphetamine that would keep you up a minimum of 36 hours, sometimes 72 we'd pass them out to the entire staff, sales staff. It was not uncommon for there to be a trail of cocaine going around in that sales meeting. Not uncommon at all. We all worked at a very hard, fast pace, and we were under a lot of press pressure to maintain being the number one dealership in the United States since we had made the cover of that magazine. I did my part. I was the guy that never went home. I was the guy that always looked like I'd slept at my desk the night before. I was the guy that would get motivated artificially by 10 o'clock in the morning and bing, the light was on. It was time for me to go. I went from there to being a used car manager in another very large dealership. and in a matter of 90 days. I was a used car director for seven different stores that this man owned. I did all the buying for their used car inventory. I bid all the trades for all seven stores. I disposed of all the cars that they were not gonna keep. Therefore, the statute of limitations are up on this now, I can talk about it. I was in a position to take large amounts of money under the table. It's the way I live my life. <clears throat> Guys, I lived, lived that way until 1986. And in 1986, I got fired from that job. I had disappeared. And it seemed like they had noticed I was gone when I come back 14 days later. And I went to treatment at that point for my fourth time. I come out of that treatment center and there was a recovery group that found me in that treatment center. It's called Cocaine Anonymous. And at that time, we were living in Wichita, Kansas. Cocaine Anonymous in Wichita, Kansas at that time had five members. I was the sixth original member of that group. Today they have 5,000 members. That was in 1986. I stayed clean and sober at that point in my life for 12 years. Went to meetings, sponsored people, did fundraisers, gave away cars at recovery dances, did all kinds of things. I moved to Colorado in 1997 and showed up in Colorado and decided, you know what, I've been clean and sober for 12 years, I probably don't need to go to those meetings anymore. In a matter of 60 days, I was smoking weed, 
drinking alcoholically. Again, picked up right where I had left off. See, I thought I'd learned something after staying clean and sober. But I have a brain disease. And so long as I don't introduce anything mind-altering into my system, my brain disease stays in remission. But the first time I do, it's a very short amount of time before I'm off to the races. So in 1999, I decided I'd take a little hiatus from drinking. By the way, my wife is Marty. She's sitting on the front row. She's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, believe me. But I decided, and it came home one night and uh, announced to her she had never seen me drink. And I announced to her that I'd been sober for a long time, and my problem was really cocaine. It wasn't alcohol. And that I think it would be just fine for me to have a glass of wine with dinner. Within 48 hours, of it being okay for me to have a glass of wine with dinner, I had a case of 1.75 liter bottles of Crown Royal under the sink. I even went out and bought a nice cradle, you know, to tip the Crown Royal from. I was off to the races once again. During that time, I, uh, I was still in the car business and I had started a wholesale business. I was kind of burnt out on retail and I decided that I'd always switched back and forth when I'd get burnt out on retail I'd go to wholesale. And what that means is is that I would go to auctions I would study market reports on I'm, I live in just outside Colorado and 60 miles north of Denver. It's the hottest place on the planet for four-wheel drive vehicles. So I would do these market studies and we had all this information that we had access to. And I would go to places where they didn't need four wheel drive diesel Dodge trucks. Like Phoenix, California, Florida. And I had joined for forces with a guy that had a limitless amount of money. These auto auctions knew that if I showed up, let's say their, uh, let's say their total number of cars that they would sell per, sell per day were 350 cars, that most likely I would be 10% of what they sold over a week's time. It was not uncommon for me to buy 25 to 40 cars per week when I would go. I had gotten so good at it because of the repetition of being in the car business for 32 years that I could be standing in an auction lane, say number seven, and eight lanes over in 2015, or lane 15, I was so in tune with what was going on, I could tell you what kind of car was in that lane and where the money was at. After standing around in auctions for that many years, it becomes second nature. So it wasn't very long before I was getting these invitations from these large automobile auctions. Mr. Bradley, would you like to come to our sale in Las Vegas? We, of course, will put you in a five-star hotel. In addition to doing that, you'll fly in the front of the plane. In addition to that, we will meet you at the airport in a limousine and provide for you whatever it is you like. It was all there when I got there. The finest whiskey money could buy. Everybody knew that I was an opiate addict by that point. And there'd be a bottle of pills. 1.75 liter bottle of the finest whiskey money could buy and they would take me to my hotel just to get me to their sale. You know, after you do that for so long and they're, they're actually treating you like you're a rock star, you kind of start thinking you are one. And 
I lived like that and functioned at a very high level like that until I couldn't function anymore. In 04, this is where This is where this part of my story starts getting pretty tough. As that's the first part of it wasn't. I'm playing golf at the local country club, which I'd belonged to for a number of years. And we're having the clubhouse bring out shakers full of martinis to us on the golf course. And we get done. and. Let me back up just a minute. When I moved to the state of Colorado in 1997, I was never going to date anyone that had kids. See, I'd already raised kids. And I was never going to get married again. And along came that long-legged blonde. Oh, by the way, there was a seven-year-old right behind her. <laughs> who I have raised as my own daughter. But anyway, I'm on that golf course that day and, and uh, at that time, which I always switched back and forth to running dealerships to doing, the, I'd stay out on the road and sometimes I would spend all the money to go all the way to Florida or to Phoenix or wherever it was I, I was working at that time. And when I would get there, I'd get so imprisoned with dope and whiskey that I couldn't get out of my hotel room, sometimes for a week at a time. Sometimes I didn't make my return flight home. And I'd try to stay over the next week and get well enough that I could go to auctions the following week. So I was going through one of those phases. Of, I don't remember if she can probably tell you, but it was probably during one of those times where I said to her, I know what I'll do. I'll get off the road for a while then everything will be okay. <laughs> so I was the used car director for a large dealership in Loveland, Colorado. I'm on the golf course that day and they're bringing martinis out to us and of course I'm eating handfuls of Oxycontin as we're playing golf. I looked at my watch and it was 15 minutes till 3. And I was supposed to pick our daughter up in middle school. So I went out and jumped in my car and took off to uh, pick her up at middle school. And I got to tell you, when I got there, I was in a total blackout. I had probably eaten that day, I don't know, six 80 milligram Oxycontin. And I'd probably had 15 martinis. And I'm driving to pick up our daughter. I got in some kind of confrontation with another parent in the parking lot. I think I found out a year ago <coughs> that I had bumped another parent's car. That's what the confrontation was about. So I'm leaving uh, after picking up my daughter and this person I had gotten this confrontation with, and keep in mind I'm on a D-tag, you know, I, I never tagged a car. I was, always had one whether I was working for a dealership or not, most of the time they provided both of us one, myself and her. Um, but I had a D tag on and I knew this person was following me. So I'm headed down the side street. Fortunately, I was only doing about 40 mile an hour. And fortunately, I was in one of those three, three quarter ton crew cab four wheel drive trucks. I'm watching the guy in my rear view mirror knowing he's writing down my tag number and I hit a parked car doing 45 mile an hour with my daughter in the front seat. She wasn't hurt, thank God. But I went back home. By the way, I got fired the next morning. But I went back home after I got fired the next morning and I'm sitting in my chair and I've got 
probably 50, 80 milligram Oxycontin on one side of me, and I've got a 1.75 liter bottle of whiskey on the other side, and I'm waiting for him to come arrest me. You guys never came. Friday, my wife walked in, and I don't remember exactly what she said to me because I keep in mind I was completely blitzed. But my answer to her was, I need help. I entered a treatment program the following morning. And I'm not going to take up a lot of the time explaining to you the story about me getting there. I wound up in the parking lot of this treatment because I needed my car. <laughs> I'm not going to treatment and not have a car, you know. And I wound up in the parking lot of this treatment center with an ambulance on one side and two police cars on the other because I had fell forward and passed out with the harness on. The harness was across my neck and they couldn't find a pulse when they got there. So I went to a very nice place. If you're not familiar with it, it's called Rapo Detox in Denver, Colorado. I was laying in that detox the next morning in a total blackout course coming to. And the first thought was I was going to Valley Hope and Parker. That's where I, Parker, Colorado. That's the parking lot I was in when they sent the ambulance and the police cars after me. <clears throat> I wake up in this place and I look over out of one eye like this and I kind of look over in the corner and there's a big puddle of puke and there's the smell of urine everywhere. And my first thought is, God, I thought Valley Hope would be nicer than this. About that time I go out, long story short, they tell me I have to blow zeros. This old guy that was obvious, a street guy, told me, he said, if you want to get out of here and you want to blow zeros, you go over to that Kool-Aid machine and you drink that super sweet Kool-Aid until you can't drink anymore and then you'll throw up you'll blow zeros and you'll get out of here. Well, I followed his instructions to a T. I walked over with a cup, stood at the Kool-Aid machine, drinking one cup after another until I vomited. I'm standing in line waiting on these people that are taking the breathalyzers to see if they can, they can leave or not. And every one of them, she said, nope, you're not there yet. Next. Nope, you're not there next. <laughs> I get up there, blow into this tube, she said, you're blowing zeros, you can, you, can, you can leave. I turn around to the guys that are still standing there because they just failed, and I said, you need to talk to that guy right over there. He'll tell you how to get out of here. Before that happened, I walked outside, and it was a nice little smoking area, but it had barbed wire on top of it around the, around the fence in the smoking area, and I went out there and smoked a cigarette. I was a pretty popular guy because I had two packs. And I'm standing there. We had two personal vehicles at the time. One was a Subaru, which I was driving, and the other one was a crew cab Explorer truck. And I'm standing out there smoking a cigarette in that, that little barbed wire fenced area, and I look out there and I see my Ford truck in the parking lot, and I'm thinking, God, I know I was driving the Subaru. About that time, I see the door open and that long-legged blonde gets out one more time to walk up to where I'm having a cigarette with the boys. And uh, she took me from there to Valley Hope. Guys, getting clean and sober was probably the most difficult thing I'd ever faced in my entire life. Keep in mind, I had accomplished every single thing I'd ever set my mind to. I skipped over the part about, at one point, for about a four-year period, during that first time of sobriety, my partner and I owned five car lots, three of which we owned the property on. I was always really good at making money. I was never very good at keeping it. But I could make it, keep the ball in the air financially, somewhat keep the ball in the air. And the other six days a week, I found out that if you were in recovery, there was a place in Greeley, Colorado called 
Island Grove. Island Grove was a uh, indigent detox center. So what that, uh, what that means is, is I was showing up there six days a week like I had a job. And I wasn't doing that because I was a nice guy. I was doing that because while I was there, I didn't have the obsession to drink whiskey and take opiates. That's the reason I was volunteer there. I felt safe at that place. It's the only place I ever felt safe. The only place I'd ever been before in my life. I wanted to drink the whole time I was in treatment. But outside of treatment, it was the only place that I felt safe. I'd been doing that for about 90 days. And one day the director walked up to me, and keep in mind I'm alcoholic through and through. Some of you are familiar with how alcoholics think. And she walked up to me and said, Keith, I need to see you in my office. I felt like I was in the second grade again and I was on my way to the principal's office. I knew that surely I had done something to mess this deal up if they weren't going to allow me to come back anymore. I walked into her office and she said, Keith, I have no idea why you keep coming down here every day at 8 o'clock in the morning and stay until 9 o'clock at night, but I want you to know how much we appreciate it. I said, well, thank you. She said, do you know what HIPAA laws are? I said, yeah, I'm familiar. She said, well, I have a family that's looking for their loved one and because of HIPAA laws, I can't even acknowledge to them that he's ever been here and he's a regular. And she said, you know him. Would you mind contacting this family and see if you can possibly reunite them with their loved one? I said, yes, I would mind. No, I won't do that. But I'll tell you what I will do. On the river in Greeley, Colorado is where the most of the homeless population lives. We call them campers. And I said, I know where he's at. And I'll go talk to Kim and see if he wants to reunite with his family. I will do that. So I went to the liquor store and I'm 90 days sober and I'm walking in the liquor store. And I go to the liquor store and I get a pint of vodka. And I head down on the river where the campers are and I'm walking through this homeless camp and I find Kim sitting on a rock just kind of staring out at nothing. And as I was talking to him, I said to him, I said, Kim, do you have any desire? He'd been homeless for 15 years. I said, do you have any desire to not live the way you're living anymore? He said, Keith, I have a desire to die. That's what my desire is. He went on to tell me about he had tried to end it the day before sitting on a railroad track and a couple of homeless guys drug him off before the train hit him. So I explained to him what had happened with, and I'd been doing this for 90 days and I'd seen Kim 25 times in this detox center. <clears throat> he said, Keith, I think I would write, like to reuni reunite with my family, but somehow, some way, I gotta get straightened up first. Well, attached to at that time, the Island Grove Detox, the Indigent Detox Center, was attached to an indigent treatment facility that was a 45-day treatment. And I knew the director. And I said, Kim, here's what you're gonna have to do. It's not gonna be three hots in a cot and a short stay at Island Grove and then back in the street. What you're going to have to do is you're probably, in order to get completely detoxed, you're probably going to have to be there five to seven days. And then I'll come get you and transition you into this 45-day treatment. They called it TRT. But if you're not committed, don't give your family the false hope. And he said, Keith, I'm committed. I took him to Island Grove. He wound up being in detox for 10 days. 
he come out of detox and I drove him over to TRT and he wound up staying there 60 days and all the while that Kim was in detox and treatment I was communicating with his family who had not talked to him for over 10 years <clears throat> so we set up this meeting and uh, he wanted me to be there with him and they came from three different states to see their dad their brother and their son Kim was all three all of the family members I want to tell you something guys I'm a guy that's accomplished everything from a business standpoint from a personal standpoint everything that I ever set out to do I accomplished other than being able to stop using dope and alcohol on my own if I set a goal of owning a car lot I owned five if I set a goal of being a used car manager with a large dealership I always became the GM and I got a lot of satisfaction from that the day I re reunited Kim with his family <laughs> something happened something happened inside of me I didn't know how I didn't know why but I knew that I wanted to repeat that feeling over and over again and it was better than anything I had ever gotten from cocaine oxycontin or whiskey the feeling that I had that day was so overwhelming it was incredible and I started sharing that that situation that I had been in with a few people that were very near and dear to me that had been clean and sober for a little while and uh, I got the opportunity to start attending summits like this one I got the opportunity start going to workshops that were on recovery I got the opportunity to start attending symposiums that were all CEU accredited so if you're trying to become a counselor which I had no desire to do I'd always said I was never going to be a counselor you got these CEU credits for all of these functions that you went to what I got was I got a clinical education that money can't buy by attending these workshops these symposiums these summits and these type of things that was in I started doing that that was in 05 and uh, I think it was in 06 there was a uh, treatment facility in 06 I got a phone call there was a place called Harmony Foundation that is one of the best treatment centers in the state of Colorado and it's in Estes Park beautiful setting incredible area looks very much like this one <clears throat> and this lady called me that I had heard of but I had never met before and she was in charge of their staffed interventionist 
And she said, Keith Harmony is doing away with all of their staffed interventionists. And I know that you've been doing them for free, which I did. All the time I'm going to these, these uh, symposiums and all that time of stuff. When I was in town, I was doing intervention work with homeless people, reuniting homeless people with their families, and I was doing it for free. So I already knew a little bit about the structure of a model for intervention. Anyway, she asked me if I would be interested in doing the contract interventions with her for the Harmony Foundation in Estes Park. I'd never met this lady before, but she had heard of some crazy guy that lived in, Cal in Greeley, Colorado that was doing interventions for free and she wanted to meet me. I went and had lunch with her and we made an agreement that day that we would do all of the contract interventions for Harmony. She never disclosed to me what she was going to be paid and I didn't care. She disclosed to me what she was going to pay me for each and every intervention. When I looked at it, I said, I've been in business all of my life. This contract that they have signed with you is very temporary. They're paying you for phone calls that don't turn into interventions, that don't turn into clients that are going to ultimately wind up in their treatment center. I said, you've done too good a job negotiating this deal. It's temporary. She said, no, it's not. It's long term. I said, OK, I'm, I'm a better businessman than that. But I'll tell you what I'll do. Try to make me say, uncle, give me all we can get. I did 57 interventions in a seven month period. It was the best training. People that do what I do would die for that opportunity. And it was laid in my lap. It wasn't because I'm such a strong person that I've accomplished everything that I've ever set my mind to. It wasn't that at all. What it was, I was a good enough businessman when I saw an opportunity that got presented to me. I knew it was an opportunity and I was able to identify the fact that it was a great opportunity. And for what she was paying me for in each intervention, gave us some financial relief at home too because I was no longer doing them for free. I did 57 interventions in seven months. Seven months into the deal, Harmony Foundation called me and said, Keith, is there any way you'll let us out of this contract? I said, I've been expecting your call. <laughs> and I said, take the contract that I signed and tear it up in very small pieces. And I'll do the same with the copy I have. You have no problem whatsoever with me taking legal action against the Harmony Foundation. You did me the biggest favor anybody could have ever done me. And for that, I'll be forever grateful. When they eliminated the contract interventions, they went to a referral source. What they did was everybody that called in that needed an intervention, they had three names that they were given. Somebody calls in and says, hey, Uncle Henry, you know, he was here for Father's Day this weekend. and." God, after hanging out with him for the whole weekend, well, it's really time that we do something about his drinking. But we have no idea how to approach him. They'd say, call this guy. That's what the referral lists are for the 70 treatment centers that I'm on the referral list for today. So that's how it all started with that. Keep in mind, guys, I got a lot of street smart. I may have ridden in the back of your car at one time. I've got a lot of street smart. And I know something about how to talk to, first of all, I know something about closing the deal. I was in the car business 32 years. I had taught people how to teach people to convince them to do something that day that they had no intentions of doing for 30 years. The whole idea of intervention kind of came natural to me. 
You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? He had me in training all those years to do exactly what I do today. The thing I want you to know is, is I not only work with alcoholics, I work with heroin addicts, and I work with opiate addicts, and I work with sex addicts, and I work with food addicts, and I work with all kinds of methamphetamine, the poly drugs, uh, the stuff they're getting off the internet now on the dark web that 18-year-old kids can order. They come from a third world country and we don't have any idea what's in them. We know what they're claiming them to be. But we have no idea what kind of, kind of conditions they're made in and what kind of chemicals are actually put into these drugs. So back to what I was talking about. I was talking to this lady right over here in the baseball hat before we started. And she said something to me that I 100% agree with. Every alcoholic Every drug addict, regardless of what kind of alcoholic or drug, addict, or drug addict they are, part of the nature of addiction is they expect to be disrespected. It's a byproduct of the disease of alcoholism and drug addiction. Alcoholic and every drug addict that I've ever met, and I've met thousands, hate themselves. They don't, have any dis they don't have any respect for themselves, including a moi, when I was drinking and doing dope. So my approach with them, which is what she touched on before, this, before I got up here with this mic in my hand, was it has to be based on respect. And I said to her, you have no idea how right you are. guys. I want to tell you something for every one of you that are in this room that work in the field of law enforcement. God bless you. You're very special people. You're incredible people. I mean, no disrespect by any means about what I'm getting ready to say. But on some levels, we kind of do the same thing today. I walk in. Tell them they're getting ready to do something they have no intentions of doing. And set them down and say, let's talk about it. But I don't have gun handcuffs. Almost 80% of the time, they leave with me. And a lot of the reason that they leave with me is based on what this lady said to me today. I don't disrespect anybody. I don't look down on anyone whether it's a homeless guy in the street. I'm telling you, at one point in time in our marriage, my wife and I could not go to a restaurant in Greeley, Colorado without a homeless guy walking up to me, asking me to buy him a pack of cigarettes and calling me by my first name. I knew every homeless guy in Northern Colorado. I had to enter this journey on that level so that I could learn that the need I've done interventions on homeless people, and I've done interventions on bazillionaires, kids. And guys, one, I'll tell you one thing that I've learned because of where I started and where I brought this deal to at this point, the need is the same. The addiction of alcoholism and drug addiction does not know zip codes, does not know bank balances, does not know fame. That guy, the first guy that I reunited with his family, Kim, the addiction he had with a guy that I work with that is a billionaire that owns a professional sports team, their addiction mirror each other. They're hanging around in different circles.
the homeless guy had a box. The guy that owns a professional sports team. I can show you pictures of his home in Italy, Brazil, Mexico, Denver, Florida. He has homes all over the house, all over the world. Kim had a box. Beyond that, there's no difference. See, in Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things that they teach everybody that comes into the program, what separates an alcoholic from a normal drinker or a heavy drinker is the phenomenon of craving. Once you start, you can't stop. That's why you can call me Johnson. I didn't quit drinking 12 years ago. I put off having a drink one day at a time for 24 hours is all I did. I went to a lot of therapy. I went to a lot of counseling. And I do a lot of volunteer work. T today is Tuesday. I come out here yesterday. Had I been in the state of Colorado last night, I would have chaired the beginner meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous in my hometown in Greeley, Colorado. That's how I stay sober. Guys, I live this life today. I compared the way the auctions used to treat me as a rock star. Guys, I live this life today that is beyond comprehension. I had never been to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. But let me assure you one thing. I will be back. Two weeks ago, my wife and I landed in LAX. She works for another guy, too. She does the same thing for him that she does for me. And what she does for me is everything behind the scenes. See this little monitor here? I'm not smart enough to click that thing when I change. She clicks it for me. I'm not smart enough to send an invoice through a Square account. In fact, if it was left up to me, I'd say, I'll just forget it. Never mind. Because that's who I am today. I'm not smart enough to make that little picture that's up there now with the guys on the mountain reaching down and sharing, helping the other guy to the top. I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm smart enough to be the guy that's reaching out to the guy below him, though. I could not do what I do today without her. Guys, the United States of America is in an opiate epidemic. And I want you to understand something. Half of the people you encounter didn't just wake up one day and say, hmm, I think I'll become a heroin addict. I had a phone call this morning that I talked to a 35-year-old female mother in Denver, Colorado, that her daughter was in a car accident eight years ago. She started out on Percocet, 7.5s. She graduated to hydrocodone along with the Percocet from, not hydrocodone, what am I trying to say? To Oxycontin. Oxycontin they're all under such a fishbowl now with the feds breathing down the back of the necks of all these prescribing doctors that her need has outrun the ability of that prescribing doctor to provide her any more of a higher dosage than she's getting. So she's buying Oxycontin in the street. And I don't have to tell you what she's most likely doing to get that money. And the natural transition from there, the street price of Oxycontin is a dollar a milligram. When I got clean and sober, I was doing 350 to 500 milligrams per day and drinking a quart of whiskey on top of it. My curse was as I could afford it. 
she didn't know I was a, she didn't know I was an opiate addict when I went to treatment. I think the counselor told you, didn't he? Or did he make me call you? She did not know I was an opiate addict and I had been an opiate addict for five years. We were making enough money that I could hide the money to pay for the opiates. Back then they didn't have any tracking system. In fact, the state of Wyoming participated in my addiction and I'll tell you how. The guy that I was getting them from lived in Fort Collins, Colorado. Fort Collins, Colorado is about 30 minutes from Cheyenne, Wyoming. So this guy had, he had scoliosis. He was in the, from the military. He was discharged honorably from the military and I met this guy. And he's trying to sell these pills that he's been prescribed every month to have money to live on because he was disabled. He was getting his disability from the military because of the scoliosis, but he's a pretty street smart guy himself. So he had a script doctor in Colorado. He had a script doctor in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and he had a script doctor with the VA. They were all large, large amounts that I was buying every single one of them from him because they made him sick. It made me sick to not have them. Made him sick to use them. I was getting 1,200, 7.5 per cassette per month, and I was getting 180, 80 milligram Oxycontin per month. I wasn't selling them. I wasn't losing, I sure as hell wasn't giving them away. And I was running out every month. <clears throat> and for quite a while, still functioning at a pretty high level. At a high enough level that she didn't know I was an opiate addict. She knew something was wrong with me. She drugged me around to every doctor that would listen, trying to find out what was going on with me. And as soon as the doctor would say something about a blood test, I'd say, I got to go. I got an appointment that I got to be at here just real shortly. They ain't giving me no blood test. So we're in this opiate epidemic. Guys, I want to tell you something that I face every single day of my life. And I don't know if it's true in your state or not. I'm going to talk specifically about Colorado. Okay. In the state of Colorado, there is one medical detox that will take Medicaid in the entire state. Now, there's some social detoxes, by the way, they're closing. One of which is the Rappo House. Remember me talking about it? That nice place I was at with the puke and the vomit and the urine and the barbed wire fence? They have three social detoxes. They're all going to be closed September 1st. But a medical detox in the state of Colorado has one that's federally approved to accept Medicaid to medically detox opiate addicts and heroin addicts. In the state of Colorado, that very same Medicaid plan, whoever's writing the scripts to that addict that's on Medicaid. They can go to Walgreens, they can go to Walmart, they can go to any place that's got a pharmacy and hand them that Medicaid card and they will give them a month's supply of opiates for one dollar. In Denver and seven surrounding counties, five thousand per day. Guys, we've got an epidemic that is beyond comprehension, and I'm in the trenches every single day. And I know something you don't know. Every one of those females that are prostituting themselves in order to maintain an addiction that started with a car accident and some doctor over prescribing oxycodone until he had raised the dosages 
over time for so high that he can't go any longer. Let me tell you something about that young lady. She wants out. She doesn't know how to get out. One hundred percent. One out. We've gotten pretty good together as a company of finding resources. I don't mind telling you I'm not above begging. Finding resources when there's a need. Now I've smartened up a little bit. I don't go searching, getting donations, and getting my wealthy golf buddies to write checks to get somebody into treatment any longer than involves an intervention. That's a waste of good resources. The only reason it's a waste is, is there's so few scholarships and there's so few resources available that I have to use them with people that say, I want help. I have no resources have no insurance. My family is all on Medicaid the same as I am. I'll go to work on that. Somebody calls me and says they want out, don't know how to get out. This call I got this morning on this 35 year old lady, so help me, <clears throat> is very fortunate. The type of insurance that she has, the, we know a lot about insurance programs. And the kiss of death for getting treatment paid for when somebody has medical insurance is three letters, and don't ever forget them when you're buying insurance. H-M-O. They're not paying. Not for treatment. Not for mental health. Unless you go to the one facility in the state of Colorado that signed up to take an HMO. Guys, let me tell you about something on the positive side of this opiate epidemic. There's a facility called the Las Vegas Recovery Center. And the most wonderful man I've ever met in my entire life, his name is Dr. Poe. He is a triple certified medical doctor. He is the only facility in the United States that is authorized to accept insurance, listen closely, for pain recovery. I didn't say pain management. I said pain recovery. Guys, I spent two days there talking in, and when I go to, how many, how many offers do we get a month for us to go visit facilities that we've never heard of? Fifteen. If I could do it financially, that's all I'd have to do for the rest of my life, fly around to all these wonderful places. They'd take me out to these fine dinners and do all of this stuff. I'm sick of their going on their tours. I'm on the, I'm on the referral source. Am I getting close? Okay, I'm on the referral list for 70 facilities. I about got full plate. But anyway, when I was at their facility and I try to make this a practice everywhere I go, if at all possible, I want to stay in this and reside in the same room that a client stays in. I want to eat the same food that a client eats while he's there. I want to attend therapy sessions because I can always use more therapy. I can tell you right now, I'm not it by any means cured. But I want to interact with the clients. I want to interact with the staff. I want to get to know who they and what they are and what they really do. Guys, there's a common term on every website for every treatment center in the United States, and there's thousands of them that use the word ability to treat co-occurring disorders. 
90% of the people that have that on their website don't have the wheelbase or the staff to do that. So just like the car business, all of these treatment facilities didn't graduate in the top of their class, let me tell you for sure. They walked this borderline ethical deal every single day of their life. And I know them all. I know a lot of them. I don't know them all, but I do know a lot of them. I know most of the reputable ones. Well, we got two scheduled next week, uh, next month, or is that this month? Got two scheduled next month. I've never heard of either one of them, but I research them before I say yes. And I talk to some trusted colleagues to find out if I'm wasting my time and theirs by going there. I'm going on two tours next week. Let's go back to the Las Vegas Recovery Center for just a minute. I stayed in that facility. I ate their food. I sat in on their sessions. The clients and the staff both told me, and it's not uncommon when I'm doing, a, I did, a, uh, what is today, Tuesday? Sunday morning, I met a 62-year-old female opiate addict at 7.30 in the morning. I flew her to Las Vegas at 11.30. Sunday after the intervention, got her admitted to the pain recovery clinic at the Las Vegas Recovery Center and flew home. Marty met me at a hotel that night so I didn't have to drive the hour home from DIA so we could catch a flight to come here on Monday. My point is the staff the clients have all told me, this, this lady was 62 years old, now I'm 65, and one of the things I have to do when I'm working with a client that I'm not certain, his stand-up, that I'm not certain is medically safe to travel. As I get the doc on the phone, on speaker, I get their hands in the middle of mine, and I'm not a doctor, I don't play one on TV. But the doctor is asking me questions, thank you, about how many tremors is going on. This lady was vibrating from the toes to her ears, from the inside. She was 62 years old and telling me about, I'm having a pretty good day today. I said, have you taken your medication today? She had not taken her morning meds. <coughs> She refused to admit that she was addicted. She'd been taking them for 12 years. She was prescribed 40 milligrams of Oxycontin in the morning, 40 mil milligrams at night. And every four hours, four to six, five milligram hydrocodone. She, that, that, that's a legal prescription. This lady was in such bad shape. After I did the assessment over the phone with the doc, I excused myself and I went outside and I said, I want you to know I'm concerned about this. And I'm not going to advise her to take any more than what she's supposed to take, but this lady needs, she's in withdrawal. Right now, she's in withdrawal. And I've had someone have a seizure on me at 40,000 feet. It's the longest three minutes of your life. And I said, I need to know what I should do. He said, give her four to six, five milligram hydrocodone when you leave to go to the airport and give her the last four to six before you get on the plane. The lady was just as calm and normal as anything you've ever seen. It's only an hour and a half flight out of Denver. Guys, the opiate addict that lives in the street. And this lady lived in a $750,000 home. And the disease mirror each other. The guy that lives in the street that hadn't had his fix for the day, that's going in to withdraw, he's vibrating the same way that lady was. He doesn't have the prescription that he can go get. The need is the same regardless of the situation. Guys, I get the opportunity 
to work with people. We also do intervention training. I do it nationally. 65 years old. When you turn 65, I'll be 65 this year. When you're approaching 65 years old, you start thinking about stupid things that you never thought you'd ever think of, like legacies. What the hell was I going to think about a legacy for? My legacy that I want to be for me is for people to say, Keith handed this deal off the proper way. Guys, I helped Ben Court. By the way, when Renee called me and said, we were wondering if you would come and speak at this deal. I said, is Ben speaking? She said, yeah. I said, I'll come and speak so long as I don't have to follow him. <laughs> I, uh, I'm fortunate enough to be a half hour from Ben's house to my house. He lives in Longmont. I live in Greeley. It's about a half hour, 40 minute drive. He's one of my very closest friends. I love him from the bottom of my heart. Uh, he's a real deal. Where was I at? I just lost it. What's that? Oh yeah. So anyway, when she asked me to speak, I got to tell you that I didn't want to follow Ben Court. And I want to tell you again what an honor and a privilege it's been to be here. This training thing that we're doing, I want my legacy to be that we handed it off the right way. You look at a guy that was, for all practical purposes, a participating and active drug addict his entire life. And I'm standing in front of police officers, talking to them. The guys that I one thing that I want you to know is if a guy like Keith Bradley can get clean and sober and lead a full life, anyone can. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Anyone can. I have this passion that started that day that I reunited Kim with his family. We'll go back and I'm going to talk about Kim one more time. When I met Kim, before we reunited him with his family, he had never had a checking account in his life. He had not had a residence for over 10 years. He was a professional meth cooker, is really what he was. He had never had a job since high school. He didn't have a car and hadn't had for 15 years. He had never had automobile insurance. And to my knowledge, he had never had a checking account. I did his eulogy three years ago. It's one thing about getting clean and sober and really doing this deal. You get asked to do a lot of eulogies. Unfortunately, with the damage that we did while we were drinking and using, a lot of us die young. <clears throat> but I did his eulogy. And I want you to know something else about my relationship with Kim. He died with everything I told you he didn't have the day he died, and he also died with a five-year coin in his pocket, and I had been his sponsor for eight years. He had had some bumps along the way, but not in the last five years. It's just like me. I had some bumps along the way. The thing I want you to know about the relationship with Kim was, is Kim taught me a lot before he left this world. I think about him every day. I want to close with one thing and that I want to go to the name of our training is intervention from a spiritual perspective. Dr. Poe was someone that said these words to me when I told him about our training and he's, you know, everybody kind of has their own Mount Rushmore. You ever think about this? Whose faces would you put in that mountain? 
of the people you've known in your life. Dr. Poe has one of those spots in my Mount Rushmore. And when I told him, he said, tell me about this intervention training you're, you're doing. He said, intervention from a spiritual perspective? I said, Dr. Poe, everything I do, I do from a spiritual perspective. He said, so do I. But no one's doing this. And I said, isn't that a shame? That no one's doing this. Guys, I've done interventions. In fact, she was involved with one. She didn't go on very many interventions. What have you done in your career? Three? With me? One of which I fired somebody at the intervention five minutes before we showed up in front of the... I had to fire somebody that was on the team. One of her first interventions. <clears throat> Another one was a family from... Ukraine. Ukraine? That were dying of wool atheists. And... Uh, I share with the atheist families the same thing I'm sharing with you today. I try to connect with a higher presence each and every minute throughout today before I come up here and talk. I don't use any notes. I left my notes on the podium. I don't use any notes. I rely upon this higher presence that I have come to believe is undeniable for this addict and this alcoholic. Before I came up here today, I went outside and I aligned myself with that higher presence before I came back in. That was about the ninth time I had done that today since I got up this morning until right now. Guys, I leave this incredible life today. I leave you with the thought of somehow, some way, if I can make an impact, we get to pick our own battles. If I can leave some kind of an impact and I can make a difference. And that's why we all do what we do. All you guys sitting in uniform on the back row, you do what you do because you want to make a difference at the end of the day. Am I wrong? You want to make a difference in somebody's life at the end of the day. So do I. So. If I can make a difference in one person's life today, it's been a win-win situation for me. I want you to know that I had a sister who died of brain cancer. She contacted brain cancer when she was 27 years old. She spent the last 10 years of her life in diapers in a nursing home at a very, very early age. And I decided, she never spoke a word in those 10 years either. I decided right then, if that was God's work, I wanted nothing to do with God. And I completely walked away from my Christian upbringing. I didn't acknowledge God. I wouldn't allow you to talk to me about God. In fact, I don't get confused by the words assertive and aggressive. I'd get aggressive if you said something to me along the lines of, you need to try church. So let me tell you what you need to try. <laughs> you have not walked in my shoes. I got sober April 27th of 05. without making it my focus and without setting this to be a goal that hate that resentment that I had at God for taking my sister not only did he take her he left her in diapers for 10 years in a nursing home at age 40 that hate that resentment without me making it my focus in about the first six months being clean and sober without me trying to influence it whatsoever became I'm the luckiest guy in this room I am the only guy here I'm the only guy anywhere that had her for my sister 
And I had her for 21 years of my life. I think about things she taught me every single day. Not a day goes by. And I'm really comfortable talking about the God of my understanding today. That's a big change. It's taken place, and I started this journey with 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. After that, a lot of counseling. <laughs> when you start working in this field, there's one downside to it or upside, depending on how you look at it. I hang out with a lot of therapists. <laughs> It, the one question I won't allow any of them to ask me is, how do you feel? <laughs> Guys, I got to tell you what an honor and privilege it's been to talk to you today. Okay, sir. Go right ahead. So, um, what, do you, what are your theories uh, about the substance marijuana being legalized in Colorado? God, do I have another two hours? No, just a quick brief. Let me tell you what the truth is. Right, they sold us a load of poles. Don't let them sell you on the same idea. They sold us on the idea that if you voted this in, all the money would go to education. 0.7% of all the tax money that's come in on the sales tax for marijuana, which, by the way, is 37% of the selling price of the dope you're buying, 0.7% has gone to education. How many commercials did they run during that election year? They said, we're going to take teachers from $50,000 a year to $70,000 a year immediately. They're still making $50,000 a year. In Denver, Colorado, and seven surrounding areas, in all of our emergency rooms, they're treating 5,000% more people who have OD'd under the age of 10 than they've ever been treated in their life. And here's why. Gummy bears look like gummy bears, right? Well, guess what they're selling? Let me tell you about gummy bears. Let me tell you what that is. I'm, I'm not taking Ben's thunder here, I th hope, but... You've all heard him before, anyway, I'm sure. But, oh, he's, you're, you got something to look forward to. He's a great guy, great speaker. All gummy bears are, have you ever heard of shatter? You ever heard of concentrate? You ever heard of oil? You ever heard of 93% THC? That's what this stuff is. When you, when you get to where you're at with your computer, just Google my first hit of oil. And you'll see what happens to these guys when they take this first hit of 93% THC in this oil form. Getting back to the gummy bears. Guess what's in the gummy bears? The 93% THC that these kids are eating. They're 5,000% more. And that was two years ago. It may be 20,000% more by now. And you know what we did to fix it in the state of Colorado? If anybody's got a pack of cigarettes, look on the side of the pack of cigarettes it says that this thing might cause cancer. Well, they made them put on the packages of candy. Not intended for anybody's use under the age of 21. That's how they fixed the gummy bear problem. It's absolutely a step in the wrong direction. Guys, on the level I'm doing this on, I'm seeing guys, and there's one, only one way that I'm certain to fail on an intervention, ever. Only one thing that makes me certain to not succeed. That's when I'm talking to a guy. There's no one home. I mean, this guy is talking to me about, you hear that compressor on that air conditioner? On that refrigerator? That's how they communicate with me. I've had that conversation with the people. When I walk into one of these oil addicts houses, every plug-in, all of this would be unscrewed and out of the wall, hanging down here by wires. 
they're looking for listening devices. Who do they think's listening? They don't know, but they know they're listening. Guys, there is now a psychiatric term in the state of Colorado that was never a psychiatric term prior to the legalization of marijuana. It's called cannabis-induced schizophrenia. When they reach this state of psychosis and they have this psychotic breakdown, I've got two cases that I've been on for over two years and these guys aren't coming home. They're gone. They're still alive. So you're making the gummy bears in Colorado and selling them and, and you're living off the taxes. Say it again, please. So they're making the gummy bears. Who? Is it black market or is it massive market or what? No, they can buy it legally in the state of marijuana at a marijuana store. Okay, but children, is there 21 age limit to get in the store? No, but here's what happened. Mom and dad buy it. They come home, tear it open, eat three or four gummy bears, get loaded. <laughs> Forget they've got the open package there, get up and go to the bathroom, the kid walks up, the gummy bears, and starts eating them. Ben's going to talk about marijuana. And, uh, isn't he? Yeah. Tonight at 6.30. Tonight at 6.30, okay. Guys, I don't want to keep you any longer. It's, it's warm in here, and I could, by the way, when I do my training, just so you know, I do 15 hours of training. Eighth, first day, second, seven, the second, and I do it without notes. So I got more. I just don't have. It's 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 just getting too late in the day. Thank you so much for the privilege of having both me and my wife here today. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to do what I do today. The very last statement I want to make is: If I die tonight, I leave this world. knowing I was doing exactly what God intended me to do. How many people do you know that can say that and mean it? And that's the truth. Thank you all for listening.